Ogun is the application of natural principles to serve human purposes. It is the use of the elements of creation to create a desired effect. It is magic, technology, science, alchemy, music, medicine, and any application of ancestral and current wisdom towards natural principles, which creates a change, be it restoration, wealth, health, strength, pain, or even death. Ogun also includes elements of human creation that are completely unknown to the world outside of its practitioners. It includes things that what we are currently calling science has not seen, tested, or developed a capacity to understand. And for this reason, possesses a power beyond anything you can imagine or have ever seen. This is Derek O'Fader Ngoan with The Medicine Shell. And today I'm going to discuss all traditional medicine, healing, and Igbo spirituality. Now, three big things. Actually, four big things. The best way to support the channel, and this is thing number one, the best thing to support, <laughs> hold on, the best way to support the channel is by joining our Patreon community at patreon.com slash the medicine show. Uh, patrons have full access to my in-house library. Uh, this is all of the different documents and books that I read and research and study in order to make these videos. It's all organized by topic. And so if you want to understand Igbo spirituality and ancestral cosmology, join at patreon.com slash the medicine show. Uh, as a thank you for your support, patrons also have full access to the Odinani Ibo Lunar Calendar. This means that once it's linked to your Google Calendar, you'll be able to know what market day it is and what moon we're under and what each market day means and what each moon means and so forth. So you can follow the ancestral calendar on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is thing number two. Thing number three is I finally, finally, finally have t-shirts. <laughs> One of the things we always discuss in the uh, Odinati group study, uh, which is a group study we have on Patreon where we discuss different topics together and things like that, is the fact that we as a generation are a generation of awakening, right? Well, there's an awakening happening all over the world. Um, and because we're kind of on the front line or we're the first to do it, we're going to need to be bold. So I'm going to be wearing my beliefs, my understandings, my ancestors, and my traditions on my chest, and I invite you guys to join me too. Uh, therefore, we have shirts available that represent exactly that. I worked on these shirts for an unreasonably long amount of time, uh, just being a perfectionist for some reason. Um, I, I guess I've never done something like this before. So the, the first shirt I sell, I'm sending you an email and thanking you because it's gonna mean a lot. And finally, if you're interested in learning the Igbo language this year, in fact, if you have vowed to yourself or made a promise to yourself to learn the Igbo language by the end of 2023, we have an Igbo language school at www.kedu.me. Kedu.me teaches the Igbo language as the Igbo language, so we don't mimic an English language uh, learning program. Uh, students are paired with both class and a coach, your coach being a person who is at home in Nigeria who can speak Igbo with you and you speak back with them and you get to practice and make mistakes in a no judgment safe space that moves at whatever pace you wanna move. And then of course class where we dissect the language piece by piece and study the language as our ancestors passed it down to us. We are currently signing up for classes. The next session is coming up soon. And so go ahead and sign up at www.gedu.me to learn the Igbo language this year. And with that being said, let's begin. Ogun is unbelievably powerful, and in fact, it is power itself. And this may be the reason that without question, Ogun is the scariest and most unknown aspect in all of Igbo spirituality. It is the most shocking and visceral, and the concept that seems to unite many people around the world towards condemning dismissing or even hating the practices of our ancestors. As the most powerful and feared aspect of Odinani, and without question, the most dismissed aspect of our ancestral tradition. Because no matter how many times Ogun or indigenous science proves itself to be true, no matter how many times Ogun is applied and it works or shows its effect, in the end, Ogun is still going to be dismissed. In fact, before I start uh, explaining what Ogun is, I have a story that might blow your mind because it definitely blew my mind when I first heard it, but it's the history or a history of Ogun in North America. 
and the role enslaved Africans played in introducing something you might be shocked to find out came from Africa. There's also a solution to this problem. And I'm gonna share that solution at the end of this video because the idea behind that solution is why I am personally very optimistic about the direction and future of all. Because as of today, it's the reason why so many people are talking about black or indigenous folk medicine, or as Indibo say, all right, so before I tell you the story, uh, the one that I said blew my mind, I'm gonna ask a question, and the question I'm gonna ask is gonna sound kinda random, or in fact, completely random, um, but it's important to this video, and towards the end of the video, you'll see why, or what makes it um, all come together. So it's gonna be towards the end of the video. The question is, and remember, there's no wrong answer. Um, and in fact, if we can get about 90 responses, pretty random number, but 90 responses, I'm gonna go ahead and make a video giving my own answer to this question, okay? So I wanna get everybody's answer. You have to type a simple A or B. The question is, is there a universal morality or is morality always subjective? Type A if you believe that there is a universal right and wrong. Type B if you don't believe there is a universal right and wrong. So a universal right and wrong means that there is an objective right and an objective wrong. And no matter the situation, that's just what it is. And then the opposite means that it's circumstance-based or situation-based, right? Type A, if you believe there's a universal right and wrong. And type B, if you believe there is not. And so the story begins with an Akan man born in the Ashanti Empire who was enslaved and sold in the British colony of Massachusetts, where he would be renamed Onesimus. Now, Onesimus would go on to introduce the Western world to a form of juju, the term a lot of people use to refer to all that would change Western medicine forever. It would impact my life and your life and literally everybody you know. And after doing this, he would win his freedom back from his enslaver, who you may not know by name, but you're going to definitely be familiar with what made this man famous because it's a trip. Onesimus was purchased by Cotton Mathers, the son of Increase Mathers, who was the president of uh, the University of Harvard, and as a result was a major political, uh, religious, and intellectual figure at the time. Now, since Cotton would spend most of his life under his father's shadow, he eventually found a way to make a name for himself. In fact, he had this kind of um, obsessive drive to make this name for himself. And now one of the things he did so that he could make a name for himself and be respected by the people around him was the purchasing of another human being in the form of Onesimus, which was at the time a bit of a requirement or a status symbol for saying that you are accomplished and you are upper crust. So picture Onesimus, right? Or before he was Onesimus, a man that was born free in what is today Ghana. He had all the prospects of life ahead of himself. He had a community, he had the opportunity to eventually find a calling or a career and make a name for himself and fall in love and start a family and enjoy all the rights and customs of his land and his ancestors, which kept him safe, healthy, and free, right? Now, 7,700 kilometers away on the other side of the world, a crusade was being launched. And at the end of this crusade, 14 women and about six men had been killed under accusations of participating in black magic or witchcraft. In this side of the world, things were changing. Uh, Massachusetts was a colony under the control of the Puritans, and the Puritans did not believe in herbs, they didn't believe in roots, and they didn't believe in rituals. All of this was classified as the work of the devil, and this crusade was being led by Cotton Mathers. Now, the man from Akan land was kidnapped at a young age, placed on a boat and sent to that side of the world, to the Massachusetts colony, to be enslaved by Cotton Mathers. Now, soon after the witch trials, a smallpox epidemic broke out in Massachusetts. In this time, smallpox epidemics were very normal to be expected. And one of the things that made it particularly deadly was that this society had no answer to the smallpox epidemic. But as the citizens of Massachusetts, shortly after the Salem witch trials began to die one by one and find themselves falling ill, Cotton Mathers noticed something that other Bostonians had began whispering about. Cotton realized that a lot of the deaths were happening among white members of the society he lived in. 
and that the black members of society tended to not catch smallpox at the same rate. And so, one of these days, he sat down with Onesimus and they had a conversation about it. And Onesimus said the reason he himself can't catch smallpox was that when he was small, his arm was cut open and fluid from an infected person was placed inside of it and that this was required throughout his village to assure that the virus does not kill the members of that community when it comes about. Onesimus showed Cotton the scars on his arm related to the inoculation. And around this time, a lot of the slave merchants had become aware that Africans with these types of scars were less likely to become sick or die from what we now understand are viruses. Cotton, who had a relatively high opinion of Onesimus's intelligence, took Onesimus's word and began writing letters to the other whites in the elite corners of Boston society. Now here's the catch. One of the first people killed in the Salem witch trials was a Caribbean woman by the name of Tituba. Tituba had studied the art of Obe, also known as Ubi, from an older practitioner in her time in the Caribbean. And because of this, she was very adept in using natural medicine to heal illness. In fact, practicing this art was exactly what got her accused and executed in the Salem witch trials that Cotton Mathers had led. Now, the hypocrisy of the whole thing didn't phase Cotton. In fact, he went around Boston parading Onesimus and preaching about this idea of inoculation that had been introduced to him by this enslaved man. Now, predictably, Boston society fought back. To their defense, this guy had convinced people to kill your wife, had convinced people to kill your neighbor, had convinced people to kill your father and your mother. So imagine this person parading around town trying to convince you to do an African blood ritual. The white society at that time called it black magic, they called it voodoo, they called it sorcery. They had even accused Onesimus of brainwashing Cotton and floated the idea that Cotton was being used to convince white people to infect themselves with smallpox so that the blacks would eventually take over. Benjamin Franklin's own brother had even written a letter against this entire idea, specifically stating that Africans were liars and that Cotton was being deeply misled. But Cotton didn't slow down. Despite the backlash, Cotton had eventually inoculated 242 people. And of the 242 people he inoculated, six died. And so Boston society's response was to throw a grenade through his window with the words, inoculate this, written on it as a warning. Now here's the issue. Onesimus was very aware that eventually this anger was not going to be aimed at Cotton and that if somebody was going to suffer, it was going to be him and the other enslaved people in Boston society. It wasn't until the Revolutionary War where Boston, the whole of Massachusetts, and in fact, all 13 of the American colonies had decided to rebel against their colonial master, the UK. During the fighting that ensued, the smallpox epidemic got worse. And it wasn't until George Washington had made the decision to inoculate the soldiers under his command that the Americans were able to gain the fighting edge over the British as smallpox and other preventable diseases were the primary causes of death during the war. Because of George Washington's success, inoculation went from being branded as sorcery and African magic to something that the whole of America grew to accept. Now, as a reward for his help in bringing this about, Cotton offered Onesimus a chance to be converted into Christianity. Onesimus refused. Rather, he asked to resume the life that was interrupted by his enslavement. He wanted his freedom, he wanted to get married, and he wanted to live on his own away from Cotton and all his madness. Not having much of a choice at the time, Cotton granted Onesimus his freedom, and Onesimus went on to have all of the things that he had requested in a new world that he and his African black magic had made safer than they had found it. Ogwu is the art of marrying mind and matter to create a solution, which is encoded in the root verb gu, to complete, finish, count, or solve, married with the prefix o, which is any singular pronoun, he, she, or it. The term ogwu itself covers a wide array of science 
problem solving and healing traditions. For the sake of this video, I've organized them into three forms to hopefully make it easier to understand. Now note, these three forms are not going to do the full range of Og justice and any application of human creativity can be classified as Og. So don't think that it ends in the ones I say, but hopefully these examples shed light on where and how these solutions are applied according to our ancestors. The first is Ogund, Ogund that pertains to life and health. This includes Afifya Nambor herbal sciences, literally translating to leaf and root. And the application of plant medicine towards healing illness, restoring health, and also enhancing ability or life. Another form of Ogund is Ogwara or ancestral psychiatry. This is the psychiatric and mind healing methodologies of our ancestors, as well as our ancestral understanding of mental health, which itself has its own diagnoses and methods that are unknown to the outside world, as well as some that would be very familiar to us today. Now, I have this wonderful book called Healing Insanity, a study of Igbo medicine in contemporary Nigeria. So I am very ready to do a video on ancestral psychiatry because that's really what it focuses on. So if you want to see a video on Ogwara or ancestral psychiatry, comment below. There's Ogwunsi, transmutation science or spiritual medicine. This is Ogwun that is often referred to as voodoo or juju, a science that bends and engineers spiritual matter known as mo towards human wants and needs the way a chemist works with chemicals or a programmer works with codes. So if you want to see a video on Ogun Si or Nsi, or you can just call it juju. <laughs> if you want to see that video, comment below. Then there's Ogunano Mano or veterinary medicine. This is the healing of animals, be they livestock, pets, or wildlife. Now, I've recently come to learn that this space of all is where a lot of our ancestral medicine was first tested, as a lot of solutions are tested on animals before given to people. And this space is not only open to pets and livestock, but also animals in the wild, most commonly animals that a community may have a special relationship with or consider sacred, but not limited to them. The next category is the all that pertains to environment, or all this includes Ntusiala, the science of communicating and working symbiotically with land, building, moving, and organizing according to the will of the land, and sustaining the relationship between community and land to sustain equilibrium and balance, as well as consent from the land for human activities that may involve land. There's also Ndoziala, land purification, or the reparation of land. There's Ogunjoku, farming medicine and the spiritual understanding of farming. This form of Ogun not only includes the production of food, but the maintenance of soil and the use of farm goods to produce medicines such as Ogunji, medicine derived from yams. This form of Ogun is named after Ahianjoku, the Abara of farming, and most specifically the Abara of Ji or the yam. Ahianjoku is unbelievably important to our people and is so important to the individual, most specifically the man, that Ahianjoku is referred to as the first wife because in the Igbo worldview, a man marries twice. First to land by buying, building a home on it and cultivating it. And second to a woman who will live on that land with him. Now, if you're interested on a video on Njokuji, comment below. Also included in environmental forms of Ogun is Ogun Amadioha, the Ogun of controlling, predicting, and working with weather, specifically the occurrences of the sky. Now, the last of the three categories of Ogun is Ogunaha, social or community science. This includes any Ogun that pertains to your profession. And yes, any profession that you are in, there is an Ogun that pertains to it, or a science and understanding, as well as a spirituality. In the Igbo worldview, an individual's profession is a part of their spiritual practice and the space by which they execute that profession, be it a barn or a workshop or a market, is all considered sacred and serve as a shrine or an arushi to that profession. There's Ogwitwe, the science of judgment and law, the Ogwun pertaining to justice. There's Ogwaha, medicine pertaining to war, combat, and competition. And then finally, there's Ogwego, the science of wealth. Ogwun, dedicated to the understanding, accumulation, building, and sustaining of wealth. Now, Ogwego is by far the most controversial type of Ogwun that I'm going to list in this entire video. Almost exclusively thanks to Nollywood, giving it a really bad name and going out of its way to kind of give it this 
um, horrible image. But within Oguego, there is an unbelievable amount of problem solving and solutions to a lot of the issues that we're facing today as a global diaspora. It is unbelievably effective and useful, and it is not what you think it is. So if you're interested on a video on all Guego, <laughs> if you're interested in a video on all Guego, comment below. Now keep in mind, I have not listed 10% of the types of Algun that exist. For example, within Algun, there's brain, organ, heart, and bone surgery. There's purification medicines. And within Ogwaha, there's medicines for bringing back um, a husband that's left the home. <laughs> bringing back a husband that's left the home and all types of things like that. That again, I haven't mentioned. But just understand that any discipline where human beings seek to understand natural principles and apply it towards solutions is Ogwaha. And Ogwaha is a gift given to us by something that lives within all people known as Agu. And because Agu is the Abara that knows what Chuku knows according to our ancestors, anyone in communication with Agu has access to the specific type of Agu that they have been brought into the world to manifest. Now listen to this. A healer in Igbo society is the Dibia. This is a person who by destiny answers a call to serve as the Agu of their community or as a representation of Agu for human beings. Now, because everybody has Agu within them, everyone has an ability to be a Dibia, quote unquote, or a Diabia, a master of divine wisdom. Now, even though the word Dibia tends to specifically pertain to a healer or a doctor, a Dibia is a person who has mastery of a form of Agu. And any application of human genius towards the service of others is Agu. So how did we reach a point that every single human being has their own all? And how does a person figure out what all is specific to them that they are blessed with or have the awful staff of authority to execute in the world? In order to understand that, we have to understand where all comes from, most specifically who she is. On a cosmic scale, Agu is the Abara or spirit force of universal wisdom, the spirit that knows what the creator and creation or Chineke knows. In cosmic storytelling, Agu is the wisest of all Abara because Agu is blessed with Etu, the mind of Chuku. This blessing is given to Agu so that Agu can do Chuku's will in the manifest universe known as Eke or Uwa. And this will, no matter how it looks, always points back to the healing, repairing and reviving of the universe, making on a personal scale, the Agu within you an agent towards this goal. For this reason, an individual who is working with their Agu is also working in service of healing the world, healing the community around them, healing their loved ones and healing people. Now, Agu is a human scale manifestation of Etu or the many gifts of Etu, the mind of Chuku. This makes the ability to heal, an ability to apply intellect and problem solving, a gift lent to people by their Chi or their creator towards the service of the universe. This also makes those who bring healing a direct connection between community and creator, a mouthpiece or hand of Chineke. And for this reason, what Chuku wishes to bring into the world, Chuku first gives to the Dibia or the Di Abia, the master of Abia. Abia being wisdom from beyond, wisdom handed to an individual by their creator, the way the creator handed ultimate wisdom to Agu, making Agu a Di Abia, a master of wisdom, and one with Chuku, or as the song says, and I'm not going to sing it. When the ignorant carries away a statue of Agu, they boast that they have carried away Agu. Whoever really seeks Agu must go to God, for Agu is part and parcel of God. All of the elements of nature or Abara manifest in large and small forms. In the human body, Agu manifests as the body's healing mechanism. And on the universal, galactic scale, Agu manifests as the universe's healing mechanism, or Udide, the cosmic spider. Nibo cosmology, the full name of the universe is Uwa Warawa, the name coming from the fact that the universe in ancestral thought is a shattered being or a shattered wife of Chuku known as Ne Chuku or Neke. I have a video called Ne Chuku Explained, so if you're interested, the link is below. But in this video, I explain the story of how Neke exploded into several pieces 
And this explosion led to the creation of the universe. And within the same story, Chuku, her husband, is currently in the process of putting her back together. An assignment that was given to Udide or Ududo or Kankwa. This means that everything we experience from life to time to purpose and being are all part of the healing and rebuilding mechanism of the Divine Mother. Udide, the cosmic spider, is the healer of the universe. Ne Chuku, the Divine Mother, possesses a body of cosmic strings known as Ete. Ete are the strings of creation. In ancestral thoughts, all things are comprised of strings and connected by these same strings, which are unseen to the naked eye, but come together to form the tapestry of the universe known as Ogodokomosu the fabric of existence. Udide is the master of stringing and restringing, constantly expanding and repairing broken fibers of existence. Now pay attention to the fact that Udide heals by way of strings and by way of connecting, because that's gonna give insight as to why Igbo medicine looks so different from Western medicine in its goals and approach. And the Dibia is for a community what Udide is for the cosmos. Udide is Agu, and both Udide and Agu are two-headed, one feminine and one masculine. The masculine one is the one that holds the instruction or the etu, the mind of the creator. It is Okago, which possesses the goal, mission, and purpose given to it by Chuku. It is also the upholder of justice and law, or the Ofo Agun, Agun staff of authority, which gives Agun the power that it has so long as Agun is in alignment with the laws and instruction of the creator. The feminine half of Agun is known as Neagun, Neagun is the source of Agun's power, the capacity and ability to heal, manifest, and connect to existence on a higher level are all sourced from this aspect of Agun. This aspect of Agun is also known as Arobin Agun, the Abara that is the consciousness of the earth. And this earth consciousness is also known by another name because Arobin Agun is also referred to as Agun. I have a video called Arobin Agun Explained, and a lot of people really like that one. I like it a lot too, so uh, the link is below if you're interested. The two heads of Agun are the sources by which Ako Nuche, divine intellect and divine wisdom, are channeled through a human being. Ako being impulses of wisdom from Arobin Agun, and Uche being impulses of wisdom from Chuku by way of Anyawu, the Abara of the sun. These impulses come together to give human beings sentience. Meaning that all times, Ako and Uche are made available to all human beings. And a person who is tapped into Amomanye, or the knowing of things, or knowing, is all-knowing. Because in the ancestral worldview, knowing is not something that is reserved to a select few or is inaccessible to human beings. The full scale of knowing is accessible to all people. And learning is less a process of accumulating information and retaining it, and more so a process of tapping in and remembering it. Now, when an individual's ete or string dictates that they should be a master of all, they have within them an anointing known as alfo dibia, the alfo or staff of authority of the dibia. Your alfo is an anointing that you receive as you are being created. In Igbo cosmology and in ancestral thoughts, everybody is created for a reason to actualize and exist within a purpose. Now the strings I spoke about earlier and this purpose are one and the same. These strings or ete can be visualized as rivers as they often are under the name Iyua, your universal stream. It is the stream that your boat will follow into the universe and out of the universe. And everybody's stream has its own direction, its own depth, its own width, and its own very specific nature that is tied to who you are as a person. Now on this river and on your boat, each person has an awful, a reason why they are on that string, as well as a promise to their chi and to creation that they will actualize this purpose and they will follow the divine laws that come with this purpose. Now because each person's purpose, each person's river, and each person's awful is different, the art of being a Dibia is broken down into many disciplines. Healing and sickness in the Igbo worldview is about relationships. What is connected to you? What is disconnected from you? And how to manage that in order to increase ndu, or life. This means that health is less about the function of a person and more so about connection between the body and self. 
or self and community. Now, just like Western medicine, the inability to physically function the way you want to is still considered ill health in the Igbo worldview. But that inability is contextualized as a break in the relationship between the self and the body, which is why in the Igbo language, Ijiaho, to be healthy, literally translates to having or possessing your body. Ejigimaho, I am not healthy, literally saying I do not possess or do not have my body. I am not moving with my body. There is a disconnect between the will of the mind and the way of the body, and therefore a broken relationship between the two. Now, beyond the body, a healthy person is seen as a person who is connected to self, community, and environment. Broken social and environmental relationships are not only common symptoms of illness, but also a leading cause according to our ancestors. In the ancestral worldview, health is more social than biological, and with this in mind, the process of healing a patient is the process of reconnecting the relationship between body and person, and then relationship between the healed and community. Ndibo believe a human is made of four elements. They're chi, eke, agu, and mo. And all afflictions start from one of these places, or at least exist primarily in one of these places, and can be focused on by healing that place, though ultimately they will affect all four. The source or placement of the ailment will determine the nature of the ailment. So for example, your chi is your creator, meaning that you have the creator within you and you are a manifestation of the creator. The creator that created you did it so for a reason, and this reason is your ultimate truth. When a person is not aligned with their ultimate truth or their chi and is being something other than what they truly are, there's a disconnect between them and their chi. The chi being the source of life or ndo means that living against your chi, moving against its timing, insulting or desecrating your chi is in essence you doing all of these things to yourself. And this leads to a decrease of ndo or life. So for example, a tiger that chooses to eat grass because sheep eat grass and it wants to be like sheep will see a gradual decreasing of their life force or nd resembles confusion, depression, identity issues, which then themselves gradually decrease your capacity to live and live and can eventually lead to death. If your chi is your son, and staying away from it means living in a cave, and that type of existence has real-world consequences. And this is explained by the ilu. If a person is called by their name and does not answer, know that they are dead. Your eke is your chi coming into physical form. And while it can be described as your physical existence, it also goes into the concept of akaraka, your predetermined destiny how the will of that chi will pan out over space and time, and how it'll affect other things. The sequence of your life events are also a part of your eke. So the obvious things such as physical illness, malaria, typhoid, and so forth, are all afflictions of the eke, or ahu, the visible portion. But what others may not know, our ancestors see destiny afflictions as also attached to the same element of yourself. This means one's capacity to attain, understand, actualize, and keep their destiny are all afflictions of this area. There are forms of nsi or spiritual medicine that can block an individual from their destiny or delay it. There are also forms of nsi that can poison an individual and kill them. And then of course, within nsi, means of better understanding and attaining your destiny, as well as antidotes to poison that all exist in the physical form and the physical world. Your agu is your reincarnating spirit. This is the part of you that comes into the world to do what your chi sent it to do. It is singular-minded in its desire to both hold what makes you special as an individual, as well as move towards what you were born to move towards. A common affliction of the agu is aragu or aradibia, a breakage in one's capacity to perceive reality and the falling of the consciousness into a mental illness. Once the person has gone against their agu or has neglected their agu for a lifetime, this includes episodes of erratic behavior, confusion, hallucinations, the chronic inability to escape failure, delusions, and antisocial behavior such as public nudity, running into forests or streams, and violence towards loved ones and family members. It's important to note that our agu is episodic, meaning that it flashes and goes. And what I described as his most extreme form, in the long term, there is the losing of an individual's feeling of self, a lifetime of confusion thereafter, and a lifetime of chronic inexplicable failure. Not to be confused with failure that comes from obvious reasons. There's also a sudden disappearance of the talents and skills that the person uses to identify themselves. As that person's agu has decided to no longer walk with them until peace is made. 
Your moi is your unseen you or your auraic self. Afflictions of the moi are of course spiritual afflictions, but like everything I listed, they will have a physical and non-physical manifestation. One form of this is uchu, the placement of a curse onto a person that attracts misfortune. Another is possession or the occupation of your spiritual space by something that is outside of you and unwanted. The reapplication of medicine comes after figuring out what is happening in the unseen dimensions of the problem. Earlier, I said that Udide, the cosmic spider, is also the universe's healing mechanism, and that all of the universe is a tapestry of strings, a cloth of strings known as Ete, and that Udide is the great weaver and repairer and expander of these strings, which we live upon as a fabric known as Ogodokomosu. These strings are what the universe is made of, and re-manifest on a personal level as relationships. These strings are sometimes described as roads, uzo, streams, e, or very literally as ropes, eri. So not only are our lives represented by a road, but these roads also intersect with other roads of the people around us, creating a tapestry of walkways and paths in life. Adibia is identifying the intersection of your road and the illness's road and making sure that there is a peaceful, cooperative bypassing of the two paths, rather than a crash or a struggle for supremacy, which then becomes illness. Adibia creates health by fixing relationships between you and what is afflicting you. For example, there are spirits which possess an individual known as Ekwensi, not to be mistaken with Ekwensu, the Abara that enforces Chuku's will. Ekwensi are what their name describes, something that allows Nsi or transmutation effect or supernatural change to happen. An equency possesses a person and this may cause them to act outside of themselves and will be pulled instead to the direction of the equency. One example is Aramon. Aramon is a form of mental and spiritual illness in Igbo psychiatry where an individual exhibits behaviors similar to a masquerade. This is often because of possession by the same spirit that makes the masquerade happen. Symptoms of Aramon include abrupt, dramatic, very theatrical body language, walking in performative zigzags on major roads or crowded areas, theatrical dressing, often theatrical inappropriate dressing, an inclination towards homelessness, a constant desire to intimidate people, omume ezuoke, which is hard to translate in English, but it's the hiding of one's greatness, maturity, and manliness, if you can imagine all three of them being the same thing, and inappropriate displays of emotion, usually in their very high extremes, shameless showiness, and pointlessly lifting heavy objects. Again, if you're interested in a video on ancestral psychology, Go ahead and comment below. But if a person who doesn't naturally have those traits is suddenly overcome by them, a possible suspect would be an egwonsi. Now, because all illness begins with a broken relationship, the egwonsi stepping out of its place in the world or stepping off of its road and entering your road, which is the specific thing you're seeing in the vaccination process. The illness is not necessarily eradicated, but the relationship it has is renegotiated. Now, I'm going to break down the healing process that most Debias follow in five key steps. In these five steps, you're going to see some things. First and foremost, Igbo culture or omenala is medicinal. And second, based on the philosophy of our ancestors and their approach towards medicine, it's very easy to see why the concept of inoculation and vaccination comes from this part of the world. Let me explain. Step one is diagnosis, figuring out what's wrong with the patient. This diagnosis is the casual diagnosis, which is different from the other diagnosis, which we will talk about later. Now, this is being aware of what you have. And because you've had it before, or better, someone around you has had it before, most ailments will end at this phase. Now, to understand why, you have to remember that Igbo society is communal. Within that kindred or family, any individual's experience with an ailment is also yours because it's difficult to have something that one of them has not encountered. This means that your community is your first doctor, or as the Ilu says, Ibim Zimako, my peers show me wisdom. In the practice of all, when a Dibia is forming medicine, the Dibia will give you the list of ingredients you need to form the medicine, meaning that by the time you have been healed of an ailment, you also know how to heal others of that ailment. And in fact, I've personally only seen traditional medicine given to people by their mothers, grandmothers, grandfathers, and so forth. This takes us to step two, which is the application of the medicine. 
Iwongo. Now, if the community's knowledge of the ailment is not enough, if they do not have the cure or have never encountered this thing before, or they have encountered it before, but they have tried the conventional cure and it doesn't work, we then go into the next step, which is the deeper diagnosis. Step three, if the illness persists, is the deeper diagnosis. This is a diagnosis which explores the spiritual dimensions of what a person is suffering. Once you apply the solutions of Alam Mada, the world of the moral and material, the next solution is to be found in Alam Mo, or as the Ilu says, When the vulture refuses to eat the sacrifice, there is a problem in Alam Mo. Ogun requires a person to take that next step, which is seeking help from a specialist known as a Dibia. Because all normal solutions have failed, a Dibia or an Ezenwai is invited to the home or visited. The Dibia will then begin a deeper spiritual diagnosis, the reading of the Ezumezu. Your Ezumezu is the full you, your mind, body, spirit, and everything that it encompasses. It is you not only as a person, but as a universe. And in this assessment, Dibia will be able to figure out what is floating around in your orbit that may be causing the issue. A Dibia has many methods for doing this, for looking at the full you and finding out what is out of place or what is broken, which at times resembles what you may be used to in a hospital and at other times looks completely different. There's the poking of certain body parts to identify pain points, protrusions, and so forth. There's the examination of things like urine, feces, pus, as well as bath water and saliva. One method is interviewing. A Dibia can figure out what's going on with an individual by asking a set of questions. Other than understanding symptoms and situations, the Dibia may ask you who your family members are, where your mother and father both come from, and who they are. And very often, your stance morally, what the relationships look like between you and the people around you, you and your chi, and you and yourself. Now, whether you have stepped outside of yourself in any regard to do something that causes you to fall out of balance, with your all fault. Natural implementations may also be used, such as the method of Igon Mo. Igon Mo is the entrance into a trans state, which can be done either by the patient or by the Dibia. And this allows an individual to see what is not ordinarily seen. Now, all of these methods are not always applied. There's a very wide arsenal of testing methods that I would probably need to do a, its own video or even video series to get to all of them. Now, a method that is commonly used across the board is AFA. Divination is a tool used to link human understanding with universal understanding. And in Odinani Indibo, the most powerful form of divination is AFA Babala, simply known as AFA. AFA is a system that allows the human being to ask the mind of the universe questions. AFA itself is an ezumezumo, an all-seeing spirit, a consciousness capable of seeing what is going on in all four corners of the universe. The four doors by which we enter and exit creation. By being able to see these things, Afa remains the most effective medium of diagnosis, especially when a deeper spiritual diagnosis is necessary. Afa communicates using a binary code and is in fact the same binary code that we later use to develop the internet in the digital world. Akon, dark, and Obi, light. Now, if you want a video on how Afa works, comment below. It is very long overdue. I'm actually surprised I haven't done it yet. And step four is the reapplication of herbal medicine accompanied with ritual once the spiritual dimensions of the ailment are understood. Ogun requires a person to take that next step, which is seeking help from a specialist known as a Dibia. Once you apply the solutions of Alam Mada, the world of the moral and material, the next solution is to be found in Alam Mo, or as the Ilu says, When the vulture refuses to eat the sacrifice, there is a problem in Alam Mo, when the usual pattern does not happen in the visible world, there is something unusual in the invisible. Because all normal solutions have failed, a Dibia or an Ezenwai is invited to the home or visited. The Dibia will then begin a deeper spiritual diagnosis, the reading of the Ezumezu. Your Ezumezu is the full you, your mind, body, spirit, and everything that it encompasses. Your Ezumezu is the all-seeing, total, and complete you. It is you not only as a person, but as a universe. And in this assessment, Dibia will be able to figure out what is floating around in your orbit that may be causing the issue. A Dibia has many methods for doing this, for looking at the full you and finding out what is out of place or what is broken. One method is interviewing. 
A DBA can figure out what's going on with an individual by asking a set of questions. Other than understanding symptoms and situations, the DBA may ask you who your family members are, where your mother and father both come from, and who they are. And very often, your stance morally, what the relationships look like between you and the people around you, you and your chi, and you and yourself. Now, whether you have stepped outside of yourself in any regard to do something that causes you to fall out of balance with your all fault. Step five is the lock and release. At this phase, you are freeing a person from the spirit of their condition or renegotiating the relationship between that person and that spirit so that both can coexist, which involves giving the ailment a physical form and trapping the mua or spirit of that ailment into that form so that it doesn't afflict the person again. Now, once the ailment is given a physical form and new terms are renegotiated, there is a physical distance that can be seen between the person and the ailment. For example, Dimmiri is a spiritual husband a spirit that follows a person into creation during the process of reincarnation. This spirit can be a male that falls in love with you or a woman that falls in love with you, depending on what the person's afflicted with and will reappear in dreams. Now, because a spirit husband and a spirit wife are very notorious for causing disturbances in the life of the other person, specifically when it comes to the romantic end of things, one of the things that is done during the process of healing a person from a spirit wife or a spirit husband is the formation of a physical effigy that represents either and the placement of that physical effigy in one of two places. One, in the home of the afflicted person if they choose to coexist with the spiritual wife or spiritual husband, but of course under new terms. Or two, in the Ajofia or the evil forest also known as the Okento, forest of dense growth. The Ajofia is a forest whose energetic properties hold spirits rather than multiplying or recreating them. This is the home of the things that people do not want to return into the community and things that people do not want to replicate as the Ajofia is inescapable for things that are tied to it. Now, because our ancestors believe in changing the relationship, rather than eradication. You run into a very interesting confusion in Igbo culture. Now, once a year, unwanted forces within the Ajofia will emerge from the Ajofia and roam the community. And while they're roaming the community, they'll be celebrated. Every community will have a time of the year, usually on the sixth moon or on Waagun, where unwanted spirits are channeled by way of maun or masquerades. These unwanted spirits will then roam the community, oftentimes terrorizing members of the community by chasing them if they're not initiated into the masquerade society in charge of controlling them, or if they're women and children. Now, you'll often see these masquerades with names such as sickness, rage, sugarcane, miscarriage, jealousy, death has no friend, poison, witch, and so forth. And the art of handling them, channeling them and returning them back into their place, as well as exercising spirits from individuals into masks, is handled by a specific type of Dibia known as Dibia Mao or a masquerade Dibia. A Dibia who specializes in the use of Mao and is a member of one of the community's Utsumo or masquerade societies. By allowing these forces to come into the community at a specific time of the year, this follows the philosophy of clearing the road so that there's peaceful bypassing between these forces and the community. Similar to how a traffic light at an intersection will give one section green and the other one red, which allows one to pass and allows and one has to stay still. It is important to note during Onwagun, the masquerade society will place very specific rules on the community because this moon belongs to the spirits. Individuals may not be allowed to enter certain forests. There may be curfews and abstinence from certain activities, as well as the very specific avoidance of specific roads by which these masquerades will cross unless you are a member of the Utsu Mo or Masquerade Society. Again, this philosophy is very similar to immunization, as we saw in the Onesimus story, where these unwanted forces are allowed to live in a community but they enter and exit in a controlled time and are given their own time and space within the year to enjoy the world. Now, it's no coincidence that in this time of the year, on Wa'agun, 
the sixth moon. Most communities go through the process of cleansing the land and cleansing the community in preparation for planting. So these fierce masquerades become spiritual protectors for the community. Again, very similar to the immunization process. These masquerades not only work in protecting the community spiritually, but during their time in the world can actually serve as judges for trials between members of the community as Onwaagun is seen as a time to repair all broken bonds. At times you'll see a trial set up where a masquerade is the judge and the accused will be somebody who's violated another person throughout the year, such as this person was stealing from my farm or um, I remember one in my community, um, one, uh, there was an argument if, if bananas were growing in one person's farm and the banana fell into the land of another person. Who does the banana belong to? Really funny stuff. Um, but these trials are usually uh, have a comedic element to them. But there's usually a comedic solution, such as you guys have to hug for um, X amount of time. Or it's really a theatrical way of repairing broken bonds and settling arguments so that these arguments are not planted into the earth during the planted season and allowed to continue for another year. But in this step, process of lock and release is done. And this is what you're seeing with the masquerades. Once the ailment or issue is identified, it is given a physical form or a physical representation. And this physical form or representation is tied and locked away and ritually separated from the individual who it is afflicting. At that point, based on the recommendation of the Debia, there may be an annual revisiting or the recommendation for you and the affliction to go your separate ways and never um, deal with each other again. But what happens on the community level with the masquerades also happens on the individual level. So oftentimes you will see individuals make things such as masks that represent the different things that have afflicted them, which is why a lot of African masks, masks tend to look the way they do. Or if you're in the Adjofia, you may see stones or sticks with ropes and locks or placed inside of bottles, which you are of course advised to leave alone. And then step six is reintegration, a ceremony or a reintroduction of the patient as a healthy person back into the community by way of celebration. This can be a group meal, singing, praises, visitations, and so forth. Now this step also involves reconciliations that are necessary if the condition caused a rupture in the relationships between a person and their environment and a person and their community. Now, it's important to note that in all these steps, healing is still social. A sick person is never left alone. Or as the Ilu says, Watching over the sick is greater than healing them. But after all is done, there is a seventh step. And this seventh step is why I say that Omena Landibo, or Ibo culture, is medicinal. This seventh step is Omenala. The passing of the healing method into the community as a new lifestyle. At this phase, the rules of the community at large may change or the healing method may become a cultural add-on that prevents the issue from re-emerging. This can be a prohibition from certain behaviors, such as avoiding certain streams, avoiding certain foods, and so forth. This can be new rules or standards for community living, such as community immunization, hygiene adjustments, and the building of preventative infrastructure, such as new arushi, or channeling devices, for the spirit that brought the healing. Because when you look at Omena Landibo, you are looking at a collection of solutions or a collection of all from the past and from the present. Because at the end of all sickness, especially if healing came by way of the Dibia, there is a recommended change in lifestyle or a vow of new behavior. And if the illness was an epidemic, which spread amongst a greater group of people, there is consultation with the spirit that brings healing. And from there, new recommendations on how to live which then become Omenala. In Igbo culture, and in the time of the ancestors, if an individual is coming from another community into your community, the first thing that is done at the border is that they are stopped and their feet are washed. Everything in an ufo, a tray, 
that carries on G has a direct medicinal effect on a person's blood pressure, blood sugar, the health of their heart, and the function of their brain. And AG is offered to every single Igbo person that is visiting another Igbo person or offered to anybody once you enter an Igbo person's house. Now, ironically, blood pressure, blood sugar, and various cardiac ailments are the number one things that African people suffer from throughout the world. AG also gives the blood an enhanced ability to fight malaria. This is one of many examples of customs, food ingredients, and practices that have their origin in some type of medicinal solution. And that's it. Thank you.